Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. I can almost see her side of the story until she threatened to crash her car because she didn't get her way. The entitlement. Gasp, shock, horror. Seriously, though, what the hell is wrong with me? But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. Rental Car Lady I work for a Chevrolet dealership. With this crazy ignition switch recall going on, we've had a lot of customers come and claim to be afraid to drive their car and want something else to drive until parts come in. Most of these people are just wanting to drive around a brand new car for a bit. We had an older couple come in wanting a loaner car. I'm giving them a brand new 2014 to drive until we get the parts. They need to sign an agreement stating that they won't have pets in the car unless it's an emergency, smoke in it, and need to bring it back with a full tank. The lady looks at me like I'm an idiot and says, um, I'm going to take my dogs in my car if I want to. And I've been smoking in my car my whole life. I'm smoking in this one too. I tell her, yes, but this is not your car. This is our car that we'll sell when you bring it back. If it's been smoked in or has dog hair and or damage, you pay the fine that's stated here in the agreement. Her. You guys put a faulty ignition switch in my car and then tell me I can't smoke in this one? What kind of company are you? You can't tell me not to smoke in this car. Me. We don't build the cars here, ma'am. We service and sell them. I'm sorry that your vehicle's under recall, but this is a courtesy vehicle and you cannot take it if you can't agree to follow through with the agreement. Her. GM will be hearing about this. I'm calling them as soon as I get home. I'm trying to tell her that we could get a rental car company to bring her a vehicle to drive and the agreement would be with them and not us. She won't listen and keeps saying she's calling GM. About 30 minutes later, I get a call from GM customer support. She was asking about this lady and then says, I understand that you don't want people to smoke in your vehicles, but you can't make people stop smoking. The woman told them that I said smokers can't take this car, even if they aren't going to smoke in them. I explained what was going on to the support rep and that I made it very clear that she just can't smoke in the vehicle, but can outside of it. I also told her about getting a car from somewhere else to drive. She then tells me, can you please get her a car from Enterprise or something? Because she was telling me that she's going to wreck her car on purpose and blame it on the recall. That would have been okay with me because any shop could prove that the recall had nothing to do with it and all the drivings recorded by Chip anyways. I call the crazy lady back and tell her that she'll get a vehicle from Enterprise. She then tells me that she will not accept anything except for a 2014 vehicle. Crazy B. I just tell her that's between her and Enterprise now, and she can tell them any vehicle request she has. And our second story. Won't cancel my internet unless you're unable to provide service? Okay. So when I was living in the city, I had a contract with my internet provider, Rogers for my fellow Canadians. After a year in my apartment, I decided to move in with my then boyfriend, now husband, on a farm. A farm on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. So I call to cancel my internet. Me. I need to cancel. I'm moving. Them. Interrupting me. Your service moves with you. You signed a contract for X years and it only ends early if we're unable to provide service. Me. You are unable to provide service. I'm moving to a rural area. Them. Not possible. We provide service to many rural communities. What's your new postal code? I provide it. That's for town name? We have service in town name. Me. But I'm not living in town name. That's just my postal address. I'm living on a farm outside of town name. Them repeats contract speech with the additional offer of an absurd buyout fee if I want to cancel my contract early without cause. Q malicious compliance. Me. Fine. You know what? I would love high-speed internet instead of crappy satellite internet. When can you come? The install guy had to call me three times from the van, twice because he was lost, and the third time because he was stuck in a snowdrift. When he finally arrived, it took him about 30 seconds to determine there is obviously no infrastructure for high-speed internet. I offered him hot coffee for his trouble coming out, and he happily canceled my service free of charge and accepted my equipment return. Cost Rogers a three to four hour call out when you count the drive, just to try and keep one impossible contract. And our next story. 
I have to tell people their results are delayed through no fault of our own, but not to tell them whose fault it is. Okay, I won't tell them. I started writing this as a comment on the post about being blacklisted by a moving company and having an employee suggest that they take them to court, then realized this may contain some useful information for others as well. As a general rule, contact slash support employees can only tell you what they're allowed to tell you, but some will always try and stretch that in a way that helps you more than the company. When an employee tells you to consider the legal route, that may be because they know from experience that only the people who do that get what they want from this crappy company. Now about my malicious compliance story. I worked chat slash email support for a company that handled certification for various technology, IT for various companies mostly, and language related degrees. The companies that held the actual exams were supposed to send us the candidates answer sheets either by scanning or by mail. Some of them chose the mail option for some reason. They were multiple choice answer sheets, scanning would have worked fine, which meant results would be delayed for weeks until we received them. Also, unhelpfully, our company policy mentioned that results become available after 48 hours, failing to disclose that it meant 48 hours after we've received the answer sheets. This led to a big number of people coming to us and asking why their results were delayed. But icing on the cake, our company wouldn't let us say that the delay was due to the company that held the exam sending them by mail. So what was supposed to happen is, customer asks, where are my results? It's been 48 hours. We say, we'll have them within 48 hours of receiving your answer sheets. They say, but it's been X days, weeks. Or I talked to X exam company and they said they sent them and to talk to you. And we keep repeating the same response, like robots. So what I did was to give them a simple piece of advice in addition to the usual message over chat. Since you're not getting a concrete response from either side, write one email, put both companies as receivers, and force them to give you a response while holding each other accountable at the same time. The result was pretty funny, honestly. Most people's response was, huh, I think I'm going to do that actually, thanks. And shortly after that, we would receive an email with the exam company CC'd asking why their answer sheets weren't delivered and when the results would be ready. We obviously responded with, we've not received your answer sheets yet. We'll have your results within 48 hours after we do, leaving the other side forced to answer why we haven't received them. As you can imagine, learning that their results were delayed because the actual sheets of paper were being sent from, mostly India slash UK to Greece, that's where our headquarters were, made people very angry. And not only them, but also the companies that hired them, who were usually the ones sending their employees en masse to get certified on new IT-related standards, and had been led to believe that these delays were unavoidable. Sadly, I left the position before I could see the full-scale results of my actions, though my supervisors expressed their displeasure at my actions before I left, they couldn't exactly penalize me since I didn't break any rules, which felt pretty good. But I believe some of the companies hiring a big chunk of the test takers in those countries started sending them to a competing exam hosting company instead, which also used my company for certification. So my actions didn't harm my employers, only the people who thought it acceptable to mail easily scannable answer sheets in 2019. I can only hope that kept going on after I left. On a brighter note, in the span of one month, I got a better paying job at an equally crappy company, left that one exactly after my paid training ended, and moved to Norway to study at a university. Hopefully, I won't have to work support for crappy companies anymore, but others will, and maybe they don't like being jerks to people either. So keep that in mind when you contact them, and see if they're not trying to help you covertly. And our last story. They can be defeated. Just thought I'd share this story with y'all, maybe it'll give some of you hope. I bought a house in a then small town called Round Rock, Texas back in 2007. Now for a little background context, I was born and raised in the central Texas hill country and throughout my entire childhood there had never been any HOAs. Some of the rich neighborhoods had neighborhood associations which are far different than an HOA. I went off to join the military in 2001 and when I came back in 2006, HOAs were everywhere. Even the neighborhood where I grew up now had an HOA. My parents had moved to a new neighborhood and my father had been constantly fighting with his HOA. 
Things like he built a tool shed in his own backyard without permission, and he parked his car in his driveway instead of his garage, that kind of stuff. So I'm seeing his constant struggle in being raised in a culture where your property was your property and no one else's business. I wanted no part of this HOA stuff. Anyway, it's now 2007 and I'm home from the military and looking to buy a house. My number one priority is no HOAs. After a couple of months, I find a home in a neighborhood without an HOA. It surprised me because it was a fairly new neighborhood and it was also a relatively small neighborhood. It definitely looked like it would have an HOA, but it didn't. I move in, love the place, and proceed to go about my life. One day, I'm talking to my neighbor about HOAs. I mention how one of the main reasons I bought that house was because it had no HOA. My neighbor, who just so happened to be one of the first people to move to the neighborhood, tells me, oh yeah, we had one of those when they first started building the place. I was surprised and asked him what happened to it. Here's a good part, finally. He says, well, back when there were still only about 20 or so homes built, there were two people who lived in the neighborhood that ran the HOA. Well, they were just awful people, and they were constantly harassing the other neighbors about grass being too high and trash cans being visible and silly crap like that. So some of the other neighbors and I looked up the HOA bylaws and realized we could hold an election to replace the HOA council, and that's what we did. I became president of the HOA and a couple other neighbors were council members. Once we were in charge, we just voted to dissolve the HOA, so now we don't have one. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.